My name is John Wayne. I'm a Western actor. And I'm a friend and a great admirer of the most decorated Marine in the history of the Corps, Lieutenant General Louis B. Puller. He calls me Duke, so like a thousand of other Marines, I don't think he'd bust me in the chops if I call him Chesty. Chesty Puller started his military career at BMI, the Virginia Military Institute. The generals Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, George C. Marshall, and George S. Patton all began their careers at BMI. This was the jumping off place for the most notable career of an officer in the United States Marine Corps. This time we were deep into World War I and Chesty left VMI to enlist as a private in the Marine Corps. His DI said, I'll bet that man even sleeps at attention. But he was finished officer's candidate school and was a Marine second lieutenant for a full two weeks before the war ended. Now, a soldier without a war is like a policeman in a crime-free society. He can either take up chess or go where the action is. <laughs> Chesty became a second lieutenant in the Haitian gendarmerie. Bandits were disrupting the local economy. Chesty's assignment, make them stop. He did. These scenes were photographed over 50 years ago. Lessons Chesty learned in Haiti and Nicaragua stood him in good stead on Guadalcanal and Peleliu.
after some skirmishes, Chesty didn't know if his reward would be a commendation or a court-martial. Chesty stopped him and came out with a captain's commission and his first Navy cross, the first of five. Count them. F-I-V-E. Chesty left Nicaragua in 1921, a captain. But something was lost in the translation, and he re-entered the Marines as sergeant. But he didn't stay in that rank long. There were the quiet years. 1926, Chesty, never much of a ladies' man, attended a dance at Washington and Lee. The belle of the ball was a beautiful young brunette of 17. Chesty proposed after the third dance. It was the wrong battle plan. So he worked out a new attack as carefully as Napoleon might have done. And Chesty Puller and Virginia Evans were married when she graduated from college. Then Pearl Harbor. Chesty was a 43-year-old major in the Marine Corps stationed in Virginia at the time. And he was a lieutenant colonel when he finally got to Guadalcanal in August of 1942. That's where I met Chesty, and I, I didn't get there until several days after he did, and I'll knock wood for that. It was a tough assault. There were heavy casualties. but we weren't cleared to go ashore at Guadal. My boss, Admiral John Ford, was a commander at that time, and rank has its privileges, so we went in anyway. Recently, Admiral John Ford paid a visit to his old pal, Chesty, at Chesty's home in Saluda, Virginia. They swapped stories. Now, Lewis, now you and I have been friends for many years. We fought together and we were tent mates. And what he's saying is only one eighth of what I'd like to say. After Guadalcanal, where did you go? Because I remember I wasn't there. Well, we went to Australia and picked up new equipment. Then we went to New Guinea. New Guinea to New Britain. Then to Peleliu. Now, Peleliu was really a fight. I don't suppose most of you people have ever seen me in a picture where I wasn't carrying a gun of some kind. Well, Jack introduced me to Chesty, and he said, Duke, I never knew a Marine who didn't love a Western. Now, why don't you put on your boots and big hat and go over there and circulate among my wounded? A lot of things in my life have given me satisfaction. I just won an Academy Award. God knows why. But when I walked among those clobbered up kids, saw them break into grins just to see someone from home, Chesty said, Duke, you're better than all the goddamn pills in the world. And I think that was my proudest moment. 
Chesty Fuller knew every kid in his outfit by his first name. I saw this sweet, tough, gentle, hard-boiled Marine walk up to a PFC and say, Jason, when was the last time you wrote your ma? The 19-year-old gulped a couple of times, and Chesty said, Write her tonight. That is an order. This same man on enjoining a battle had one question. Where are they? One order. Let's go get them. Chesty believed an officer should be a leader, and the only way to be a leader was to be all the way up front. On Guadalcanal, Chesty proved that. He continued to lead his battalion for 24 hours while carrying seven pieces of shrapnel. He won a second gold star for his Navy Cross. My enlisted casualties were 57 percent. My officer casualties, 72 percent. And I am very proud of it. Because any operation I've been in, my officer casualties have exceeded the enlisted casualties by a considerable amount. I don't think that was due to my poor leadership, but it proves that all Marine officers we're doing that duty. New Guinea, November 1942, Chesty made full colonel. One time while being shown a new type of flamethrower, Chesty had one question. Where does a bayonet fit on? Japan fell, we won the war. Field officers were no longer necessary as staff officers took over. And Chesty was detailed to organize and train reserve Marines. Hell broke loose over Korea. Chesty was put back in charge of the 1st Marine Division, but he had to reform it from scratch. Chesty pulled them together and they shipped out for Incheon, a very rough piece of real estate to take. The beaches were seawalls and jetties, and the tidal variation was 29 feet. The plan was to cut Korea in two. The Army and the Marine Corps did it. Chesty collected another gold star for his Navy Cross and the Distinguished Service Cross. Chesty was too busy to go back and pick him up, so General Douglas MacArthur personally delivered him to him at the front. That and the DSC. Chesty, you got your fourth Navy Cross at Peleliu, didn't you? And I remember very well the fifth one in Korea, 20 below zero. Around the 38th parallel, winter can come overnight. Through this campaign, the cold was bitter. It was like breathing razor blades. Canteens and spare socks had to be kept inside the uniforms next to the skin. Only dry rations. Gunners used hair oil to keep their weapons in operation.
At Joe Sin Reservoir, the odds against Chesty's Marines in the Army was 100 to 1. When he found out they were surrounded, Chesty said, good, now we can shoot at those bastards in every direction. They didn't shoot all of those people. On the way out, much of the fighting was hand to hand. Chesty's men naturally joined the rear guard. He had orders to destroy equipment and vehicles. Chesty came out with everything he went in with, plus a lot of equipment abandoned by the Army. He also brought out his wounded and his dead. their way out and Chesty brought his men to Hung Nam. Warm food, warm ships, and a change of clothing. Some of the lucky ones even had a bath. Chesty got his 5th Navy Cross, his first Silver Star, and he became a Brigadier General. During the ceremony, when Chesty received his star, an 11-round salute was fired by the artillery. Chesty said, what do you want to waste ammunition on me for? A moment later, enemy artillery opened up, and he said, well, maybe you didn't waste it after all. Chesty took an inspection tour of Camp Pendleton once and found there were no enlisted men's clubs. It was on a Wednesday. He gave them until Friday to put one in. He then declared a 72-hour pass with free beer for everyone. When they came straggling back, he sent them on a 20-mile hike. And that's a study in logic. Be sure you get what's due you, but don't take advantage of it. In 1952, when Chesty got his fifth gold star and his Navy Cross for the Chosin Reservoir Affair, and he'd asked, what's this for, sir? Chesty said, I guess I got on the mailing list. Chesty always spoke out about the two things he cared most about, the Marine Corps and the American people. Chesty knew that he was signing his own retirement warrant, but he also knew what was right for the Corps and for you and for me. Like General Billy Mitchell and others. He sacrificed his personal aggrandizements, promotions to what his educated opinion knew was right. Chesty retired as a lieutenant general in the Marine Corps. In a mustering out gala, he admitted that he'd turn in his stars to tote a rifle in any rear rank Marine squad in the world. Chesty retired to his home in Saluda, Virginia to be with his beloved family and make up for the years that the wars had kept them apart. time he goes to Lexington to visit the tomb of Stonewall Jackson, his boyhood hero, 
brings back memories of his grandfather, a major who fought with Jeb Stewart and was killed at Kelly's Ford. Then he goes to the chapel at Washington Lee where Robert E. Lee is buried. studies of this man's military genius helped him win his own battle so many years later. a sentimental journey. The nation owes you its deepest gratitude, Chesty. If you remember on your retirement, I asked if there was anything you'd wish for. Now that it's over, you said, more than anything, I'd like to see once again the face of every Marine I ever served with. Virginia. In May 1942, aboard a troop ship in the Pacific, he wrote, in part, please do not worry, I'm coming back, and then we'll have that a home with two chimneys. Germany and Japan must be stopped, and then perhaps I can retire. all the canopy and glory of the mass spy, the past review, the 15-gun salute, the fluttering flags, the bands, the president's own and perfect unison. 
I looked at Chester's face. In his eyes, I could read his thoughts. The thousands of men he had commanded in peace and war, the battles he had won. I'm trying to recall the faces of his boys. Above all, the great sadness of leaving his beloved corps. There were tears in the eyes of many, especially in mine. I say old soldiers never die. Good luck, old soldier. We need men, heroes like you in this country today. Good luck, Chesty Fuller. May you be with us for years and years to come.